Okay, so the mic is on now. We can start. Um, welcome everyone to this panel. Um, we're going to have a different setup today. Um, it's a different uh, workshop style that, than you've seen so far. Uh, since it's a no topic, we're going to address it in a no way. Um, so today we're going to address questions um, around the potential role of Article 6 to accelerate a hydrogen economy um, and transition to hydrogen in emerging economies and developing countries. Uh, how we're going to do that is that I'm going to have um, so five speakers on my left. I'm going to ask them each a question and they will have four minutes to answer. Then we're going, on, uh, going to the audience and we have pre-selected, of course, experts uh, sitting there. Um, and I'm going to ask them also, uh, each of them, we have another uh, six speakers, uh, so we're going to ask them questions. Well, I'm going to ask them questions and they're going to respond in four minutes as well. If you have time, hopefully, um, we will turn to you, but otherwise we will have gathered different opinions um, on this very novel subject. Um, both Article 6 is, um, is evolving and hydrogen economy is evolving, so let's gather all the perspectives um, and leave this room with a, let's say, a constructive way forward. Mm -hmm. um, so what we're going to do now, we're just going to you know, start with Alexandra, um, and she's going to tell us uh, how would Article 6, in your opinion, as a finance mechanism for green hydrogen, would work? Okay, so thank you for the question. I'm Alexandra Sötzer, a Global Carbon Technical Advisor at UNDP. So um, I think that your question has uh, at least two dimensions. One is the project level dimension and the other is the country uh, level dimension. On the project level uh, dimension, you would have to see if there is already an existing accounting methodology. So for hydrogen, uh, when I did a quick uh, Google search, uh, <laughs> I only found two concepts uh, with VERA and one approved method very recently approved fuel cell methodology with uh, CDM, small scale methodology. So there is not really much available yet. And then, uh, of course, it's important for the project developer to calculate the expected emission reductions and the timeline for the implementation, uh, how quickly investment can be obtained, uh, so that the timelines within, I would say, the next two years are feasible, because this is the time we have for this NDC cycle. And then when it comes to the uh, country level uh, dimension, it's uh, important to understand if there is actually potential in the country that is interested in Article 6. There might not be so much potential in uh, countries that are currently um, have already bilateral agreements in place or are exploring this opportunity. And um, then it, if there is potential and the country has um, um, yeah, it has interest, then the question is, is there already an operational Article 6 framework in place? Is the, um, is the, does the country have access to a registry? Um, is the, um, what are the costs that the country uh, is charging, the administrative fee? Does it make the project less financially viable? Are the ITMAS process flows already defined? So there are many questions at country level that have to be clarified. And uh, when it then comes to the actual process, uh, project cycle, which I think you wanted me also to briefly talk, so I will just pick a fully operational Article 6 framework from Ghana, um, where the process would look uh, as follows. So the first step would probably be for the project developer 
developer to develop a concept to ensure and then uh, share it with the host uh, and the buyer country to make sure that the project is uh, eligible. And once this is confirmed, uh, the, project would, the project developer would then have to develop a project uh, document. This can be done either um, by the project developer, him or herself, or by, through a consultant. But so far, we see that uh, the project documents that are expected from Article 6.2 um, host and buyer countries are not as complex as it was with the CDM. So it should be possible for a project developer to do this um, him herself, and uh, then engage a validator. Uh, and once the validation report is completed, submit the uh, project document with the validation report to the host country and buyer country for examination. Once the examination is completed, uh, the project developer can request authorization. And um, this should uh, be done relative, I mean, the authorization usually does not uh, take too long. But, um, and then the project implementation follows the same steps as it was in the past with um, the Kyoto mechanism. So it is the project implementation monitoring in line with the approved and authorized project document, um, engaging a verifier, um, uh, submitting the verification report and monitoring report to uh, both host and buyer country for examination, and uh, then request um, issuance, transfer, a settlement of payment, and corresponding adjustment by the host country in the following year. So in Ghana, it would be, if, let's say, the um, payment was made in October uh, of year of, let's say, 2024, then the, the corresponding adjustment would be applied uh, or reported to UNFCCC in April 2025. Okay, stop here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Fantastic. Um, before I say anything else, I forgot to introduce myself. Um, so my name is Gökçe. Um, I am a hydrogen technology expert at South Pole. Um, and I'm leading um, yeah, our activities in hydrogen globally. Um, so this was great. Now we've learned from an expert how would this work hypothetically. So Fenella, I'm going to turn to you and actually ask you about your experience from green projects. What can we draw um, uh, to hydrogen economy from your experience? Thank you very much. And I think <laughs> I would have benefited maybe from you giving us a 10 minute rundown of the exact how green hydrogen works on everything <laughs> because I think it's quite a mystery to, well, certainly to me. And by the way, you're putting me in a position of being a green um, investment specialist here, which I'm not, but luckily we do have quite a few of them in GGGI, so they have helped me with a few notes of what we're doing. So you want to know, I, I mean, I must admit the question is quite interesting because you say, now that we know how Article 6 projects work, and it's like, in theory we do. <laughs> yeah, and as Alexandra has very, very um, carefully explained, there's still unknowns and we're not sure. But where are the opportunities? I think we need to look at global goals at this point. So <clears throat> when I say that, I'm saying what's on NDCs, what's on net zero targets, everything else. Helicopter right back out and who's trying <laughs> to do what? And the Europeans are trying to mitigate as much as they can, but they import power or other things, and so they've forced that to be green by coming in with CBAM. So how do we now cross over that barrier? So this means where are the opportunities? Morocco, because their view is they're right next door and fabulous. If they can sell green hydrogen, to Spain, to Germany, to others that will help green the EU hard to abate sectors. They also have abundant renewable energy, but what kind of renewable energy do you need? Because you need pretty constant renewable energy. So very often hydro, but you could use geothermal, solar wind, a little trickier. So we're certainly working in Morocco on a 100 megawatt green hydrogen program for a fertilizer plant where that green hydrogen will be consumed in country. And that's a really important thing to remember because a lot of this green hydrogen is being, these projects are generating green hydrogen, but it's not for consumption in the country. 
And if it's not for consumption in the country, then it's not a carbon trade. It's not an Article 6 trade. They're not reducing energy. It's the steel company that buys it that's reducing the emissions. And if that's in Korea, then that's the fuel switch project under Article 6 in Korea. But they don't need to sell, they need to buy. So, you know, it'll just mean they'll need to buy less. So we've got to think more about the global dynamics of the movement of this green energy. So at GGGI, currently we're doing, as I say, a 100 megawatt um, green hydrogen program in Morocco. We're also looking in India. Um, it's flashing at me, but you know what? I forgot to look at it when I started, so I don't know how many minutes I've got. Just give me a nod when I've got to stop. Um, and we're also India. We know India have said, great, you know, if you can find a green hydrogen project here, super, you can trade it as Article 6. They've written it proudly in their strategy. Good on them, I say. I think it's absolutely fabulous. So it is a country where they will be able to both produce and consume, hopefully. So it is potentially a country where an Article 6, 6 transaction could happen. And there we're working on a... Um, we're working on a programme... With, with the Indians um, partnering with the World Bank to develop uh, a mechanism to bridge the price gap between the grey and green hydrogen. Indonesia is probably where we're furthest along, and that's um, where we're looking at a 10 megawatt demonstration project in North Sumatra. And the idea is that can be scaled up to a gigawatt using geothermal as well but it's not for the green hydrogen to necessarily be consumed in Indonesia. It's because Japan and Korea want to buy green hydrogen to green their industry, either to face CBAM or to meet their net zero goals. So where there is project availability and where it is being consumed in country, yes, carbon can help. But I know Mark Lewis, quite some time ago, um, did quite a lot of analysis of where the pinch point, where the price point is, where it actually tips over. Mm. I stopped there, yeah? That's, that's great. I think it's going to really build well uh, what I presume Ignacio will contribute to, uh, because you, you've been also looking at multiple regions uh, for investing in hydrogen projects. Um, so <coughs> perhaps you could also shed light into that. And we have some hydrogen experts, so it's a mix uh, speakers and experts of hydrogen and carbon. So we're going to you know, keep building on that. <clears throat> Great. Uh, thanks, Gukshe. Uh, hopefully my voice will um, last at least four minutes. Let's, let's give it a go. Um, so what we're doing, we're doing a number of things um, at IFC in the green hydrogen space, and then I'll, I'll come on to carbon credits and how we see them play a role. Um, I suppose there are three key things that we're doing. One is sort of knowledge. The second is kicking tires. And the third is figuring out who pays and who takes risks. So on the first knowledge, we're collaborating a lot with our World Bank colleagues to build the, the global knowledge around green hydrogen, what it, may, what it takes to, to finance green hydrogen projects. And so collaborating on different reports and bringing our perspective as probably one of the largest financiers of renewables uh, in emerging markets. We've financed over 20 gigawatts of renewables, but also working very closely with a lot of our private sector clients on you know, end uses, fertilizer companies, mining companies, etc., and trying to bring that knowledge together with our World Bank colleagues on the, on the, also on the policy side and, and see how we can, how we can sort of frame, frame the debate. The second thing we're doing is kicking tires. And by that, I mean, we're, we're, we're helping to fund actual projects, uh, the feasibility studies and pilot projects. So typically a few million dollars here and there. But what we're trying to do is try to figure out what are the real costs, what are the real issues in implementing some of these projects. Pepe Sainz uh, yesterday from Iberdrola was, was very right. You know, there aren't that many of these hydrogen projects up and running. So we need to sort of kick tires. And what we figure out is when you start kicking tires, okay. actually those tires are more expensive than you thought they were, or more complicated than, you, than you thought that they were. So we're doing that in varied sectors. So we're doing that in Costa Rica, hydrogen for, for, for transport, in Chile uh, for green ammonia, um, in Barbados, we've got a project with uh, Hydrogen de France where we're financing feasibility study hydrogen storage in a, in a 50 megawatt uh, power system. Um, uh, and we're doing a, a number of other sort of uh, uh, projects like that where we're coming to terms with where the uh, cost coming out, what are the issues when you start getting uh, detailed. The third issue that we're doing is figuring out who pays and who takes risks. And that's about bankability. And there we're engaged as potential lenders to, in, in, in those cases, typically very large projects, sometimes for export, 
uh, and, where, uh, and, and that's mainly, I would say, green ammonia um, in North Africa, in India, in Southern Africa, uh, and potentially something in Chile that we're looking at, where um, we're trying to figure out, okay, what's it actually going to take to finance this thing? And when you start scratching your head, you realize it's going to take a lot. There are huge risks from a bankability perspective. And um, I've got a list of at least 12 key risks that can be all deal killers for some of these projects. But the, the, one of the primary one is, I mean, who pays for this and who takes risks? And who pays for that is who to up takes this at what price? Because as a, as a banker, we need somebody to guarantee a price for a long-term period. And, and that, per, that a counterparty has to be credit worthy. So that's sort of one element. Now, we're also uh, trying to see, okay, well, how can we soften that blow for the off-taker? And that off-taker could be a private company, could be the Germans, could be uh, through H2 Global, can be you know, Japanese support programs, etc. But so there's where we're looking at blended finance, we're looking at other things, and where we're hoping that you know, the carbon credit market can play that role in trying to you know, bridge that, that affordability gap. Um, so we're starting to look at, at, at the carbon credit market, how you incorporate that. Now, again, it's not going to be without its challenges, because, again, who's going to, you know, fine, I need a 20-year offtake for my, my green ammonia at a fixed price. I also need that for the carbon credit uh, if I'm going to uh, put that into my financial model and actually bank against it. So is that going to be available? Who's going to pay that price, et cetera, et cetera. So, again, not without its challenges, but it's, it's hopefully going to be a piece in that puzzle. Thanks a lot, Ignacio. Um, over to you, Demetrius, um, to hear your perspectives on um, pretty much the same question. Actually, we're just going to follow up. So let, let's back up a little bit. I think the, the fundamental question that uh, we started with is why the world cares about hydrogen and why are we all keen to develop it? And, and the bottom line on that is that it is impossible to think about arriving in a net zero world without a very low carbon hydrogen. Uh, the system simply doesn't work. And hydrogen, in contrast with uh, solar and wind, is actually fuel. It's something that you can store, it's something that you can parse and use in small quantities or in big quantities. And that is a very fundamental uh, differential of green hydrogen compared to everything else that's clean energy. Now, in the World Bank, we, we launched actually in the last cup, in Cup 27 in Egypt, realizing that there is a lot of talk about hydrogen, there's a lot of hype about hydrogen, and a lot of our countries uh, were coming to us with a lot of questions about what do we do about hydrogen, should we invest in it, uh, how can we advance it, is it worth it, how much does it cost? So we launched uh, at the last cup Hydrogen for Development, which is an initiative of the World Bank through our Energy Sector Management Assistance Program. And we're trying to answer all of these questions. Uh, so we have issued some initial reports about the role of hydrogen in developing countries. And we're working in more than 20 countries of our client countries uh, at this point, helping them all the way from thinking strategically about hydrogen, looking at particular projects, and finding out what are the opportunities for international trade. So, to summarize some key facts about hydrogen, at the end of the day, green hydrogen will be produced by electricity, and for this to be green, it needs to be green electricity. And our models and others have done similar work show that at the end of the day, to get to this magic number of a dollar per kilogram of hydrogen, your underlying cost of power needs to be around two cents per kilowatt hour. So to get to two cents per kilowatt hour of clean energy, either wind or solar or wherever you have it, hydro, uh, you see that most of the wind and solar resources are actually in many of the developing countries. Uh, they are across the equator and they're close to the coastal areas. And in many cases, uh, in places where the cost of land is not outrageous. So the opportunity in the longer term that hydrogen opens up, and this is really unique for hydrogen, is that we have a possibility of trading clean energy from poor countries of the world with the richer countries who are not as favorable of geographic environments, and through that way, clean the world's energy system and help development itself. So these are the underlying fundamentals of why we're looking at hydrogen in the World Bank. Now, uh, what we've been doing a lot lately, and we will be issuing a report for the Breakthrough Initiative, is what are the right policies 
so that we can get hydrogen going uh, around the world. And again, we're not really reinventing the wheel because at the end of the day, we have learned about what it takes to advance clean energy through all the experience that we had with uh, solar and with wind. And for sure, for hydrogen as well, the potential of walking down the learning curve is absolutely there. The cost of wind and solar, despite the recent bump, will continue to go down because scale is going up. Uh, we are seeing cost of batteries picking up again a, a downward trajectory. And the, and the missing link at the moment on hydrogen is electrolyzers, where the potential is pretty good because we have very little scale now and cost reductions are quite possible. And then transport and storage. So there is some way to go, but the fundamentals are very strongly there. Uh, we're advocating for them. And the clear benefit of Article 6, as Ignacio mentioned, is to what extent we can use payments for carbon credits to buy down the initial spread between green hydrogen and the high carbon hydrogen. At the end of the day, even on all the fuels that we're burning, what is really bringing the energy is the hydrogen. Carbon is oxidized and goes to the atmosphere. That's the problem. So hydrogen anyway is the energy that is everywhere. I think what we really should be focusing now is how do we purify it and how do we really get it in the world's energy mix. And I think the focus is right. Uh, there is some way to go, but uh, international coordination will help. Now, Article 6 really doesn't work. We have to make it work. I mean, there is very little trade of carbon markets happening between OECD countries and the developing world. And that needs to be fixed. Thanks a lot, Demetrius. Um, now let's look a little bit of, you know, what needs to happen so we can include uh, hydrogen and have some pilots um, under Article 6. We need methodologies, of course. So, Hugh, what's your view on methodology development and could methodologies that are verified under um, gold standard, certified under gold standard, be used for Article 6? Yeah, um, so I, I work at Gold Standard, one of the standards serving the, the carbon market. And I mean, working in a standard in the carbon market is constant evolution. So we've had a period over the, uh, in the carbon market so far where a lot of projects under Gold Standard and other standards have been in renewable energy. We've come to a point where in many places, renewable energy doesn't need carbon finance anymore. And we're moving kind of further down the cost curve and into new technologies as they come through. And so we're seeing interest now in the role that the carbon market can play supporting green hydrogen projects. Um, and Gold Standard um, entered into an initiative last year with uh, South Pole, uh, with Perspectives, and with Vera, um, the Hydrogen for Net Zero initiative, to look at uh, new methodology development for the carbon market for green hydrogen and hydrogen projects. And um, it's an exciting initiative because we're looking at how you can bring through methodologies uh, across different applications and also how we can look at standardization of methodologies across different standards, which is something that we, we haven't done before. Um, and then under gold standard separately, we currently have a, a green ammonia methodology under development. So it's an area where there is development coming through. And you can also see the link quite clearly to Article 6. We heard about India earlier, which released a positive list of um, activity types where it's interest in Article 6.2 cooperation. Green hydrogen was on there. You look at the NDCs of other countries, you see this reflected in the NDCs, often in the conditional component, because this is where support is needed. And so you can see a role in the market and carbon finance supporting countries in the hydrogen transition that they want to make over the, over the coming years. Um, and I also think that Article 6 can play an important role here because there is this point about who buys the credits at the end of the day. And this is still to be proven. We don't know what this looks like. I can see a stronger role for governments being the purchasers to support countries in their transition than this maybe being a credit which is of interest in the voluntary market. So I see there being quite an interesting role for Article 6 in the future. But we're still at the start of the, the development of this. And the hydrogen and carbon market communities need to come together, I think, as we, we start to bring this forward. Thanks a lot, Hugh. So thanks everyone for being on time. We might have more time, but now we're going to do the, the floor and we're going to share a microphone. So, um, Michelle, so you have been working with Inter-American Development Bank. I want to hear uh, what do you think of carbon market developments um, and hydrogen developments in Latin America? Thank you. Um, when you talk about uh, hydrogen, you are usually talk about a gap, a cost gap. You have the price when a hydrogen can be produced and a price of clean hydrogen. 
can be produced and the price that people is willing to pay to grain things. And there is a gap. And there, there is different ways to fulfill this gap. One way it's carbon pricing, another way it's subsidies, and the other way it's different kind of subsidies to mitigate risks. So there it is. And when you look about Latin America and the Caribbean, when we start to, to work with that, if you see most of, many of our countries have huge renewables and you have countries that have 100% renewables in Latin America and the Caribbean in the electricity matrix. So they said, that's our moment, you know? Uh, if you look at Brazil, for instance, it's not 100%, but it's one of the hugest high, uh, renewables. And you look on some place in Brazil, like Sierra, you see that actually you have a complement. So you have a good load and you probably have one of the lowest costs on renewables in the world. So when you talk about two cents, Latin America is saying, if somebody can do it, it will be us, let's say. That's, so that's why you have a lot of countries in Latin America with interest on that. But still, there is a cost gap. Even in the, pl the place where you have the most competitive uh, market, we still have this gap. Um, and this gap, uh, when you talk about financing, the finance gap, so I guess it's important to separate both things. One, it's the finance, a bankable project, and there, most of the private sector is good to that. You don't have a, I don't believe you have a financing problem that different of other financing problems. What we have is that we need to have a, we have a gap and we need to be able to finance this gap and otherwise the projects will not be bankable. So there, that's not different what we have in Latin America to other regions in the world and we can see, um, this kind of uh, of problem there. Um, so when you talk about this uh, this 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 gap, uh, we always talk about some kind of mechanism related with a clean to be sustainable. So the Article Six or other kind of mechanism. And for that, the questions of certification is is, is key. Because when you define what's green, or even using the word green, have a lot of elements behind it. And when you talk about Latin America, you have some specificities on the renewables. And one of these specificities is hydroelectricity. And big amount of hydroelectricity. And in some countries, all the, the, the elements that is detailed on the, uh, the European definition um, does, not, does, not, does not work for some countries. So, in resume, um, we have a gap. Financing does not mean uh, the financing gap for the developing institutions should be focused on how to finance this gap. The other part can be provided by the private sector in Latin America and in the other place. And when you talk about finance this gap, you talk about finance because of climate objectives. So it's Article 6 or other kind of climate uh, mechanism that you can use. And for that, one of the key elements is how to define green or how to define sustainable and how to, to price the CO2. And for that, it's really important to consider the, the, the different elements and the characteristics. Just, just to finalize one thing that people always uh, raise, and it's the IEA document as well. If you have a solar uh, providing um, a solar that the, the pineal comes from a place where the electricity it's, it's uh, produced with, um, with coal, the solar hydrogen can have much more um, CO2 emissions than another project that comes for other kind of technologies, but it's not, uh, but with a ch uh, less CO2 emissions in the production of the generation. So life cycle and how to take in account it to certify. Thank you. sharing the microphone. Um, great, so we have identified already another gap, that is you have the finance gap, we still have the certification and definitions and terms uh, so that we can define what's green. Um, let's go back to regions and I want to ask you, uh, Jan Miram, about the regions that the EBRD uh, is looking at, which regions EBRD is looking for hydrogen projects. We've heard Morocco, I suppose it's also Egypt, so perhaps you can share also what, what priorities you have and we can start already talking about capacity gaps. Yeah, thank you, and uh, and thank you for having me here. Um, so, um, where to start? The um, let's say uh, we we think at the moment, and um, most likely we could come out with further reports later in the year uh, on our assessments uh, as to the the regions uh, we work in. Um, 
But if we for a moment assume a, 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 an electrolyzer demand of about 23 gigawatt, um, which would equate to some 60 billion on, of investments uh, over time. Um, so there's a lot of space for investments for, for all of us. Um, so we think that the region we work in, so Northern Africa and the Caucasus, um, uh, could, uh, um, let's say, serve maybe uh, up to 65, 70 percent of that uh, total demand. And that's purely then on, on the basis of the kind of the, the marginal cost of the, of the region, uh, the fact that uh, there's an abundance of wind and there's an abundance of, uh, of solar. So now how to convert that potential into uh, reality, that, that's the, the name of the game. And here we of course have a whole suite uh, of, uh, of instruments. Uh, first of all, we do a lot of uh, what we call policy dialogue. So we work with uh, national governments on long-term strategies, on low carbon pathways for the energy sector, because the key one is to green the electricity sector, the power sector. It is, uh, we can't go for electrolyzers if we can't find the green power. Um, and then, of course, uh, scale will help to, uh, well, at the moment we work with funds like the Climate Investment Funds to kind of do the first pilots around electrolyzers, but eventually the market uh, size and scale should drive down the, uh, uh, through learning cost, uh, should drive down the, the cost uh, per, per megawatt uh, of electrolyzer capacity. Um, so it's really, a, uh, now in this business, uh, a big, uh, going big is needed. Yeah, so it, uh, you, you can't build a refinery on a, on, on a few millions. Uh, it, these are very big tickets. So I think one of the issues is how to organize the very large scale investments uh, in, in one, one go. Um, so we work on, uh, on the policy side, but we also work with counterparts on uh, so corporates, uh, refinery companies, uh, uh, electricity companies on creating that understanding and capacity and working on feasibility studies uh, with them on the design of, uh, of these uh, systems. As to the, the role of the carbon market, um, as Vanilla was saying, if uh, it really depends where where you use the green car, uh, the green hydrogen, yeah. So if it is being used in Europe, uh, it counts towards the NDC of Europe uh, or EU. Um, uh, if so, there's no Article Six relevance uh, in in that. However, I do see an Article Six relevance in trying to kind of scale up the renewable energy investments. There is where the bottlenecks are, where also we need uh, investments in infrastructure. So I think the, the, the comment that renewable energy can pay for itself, that's just an, uh, it will, will require a more system approach as to thinking. So yes, indeed, generation is cheap, but you need a lot of infrastructure to bring it to the uh, to the electrolyzers and, uh, and storage capacity. So we need a more system approach as to assessing what is the emission reduction potential uh, from a carbon market point of view, rather than just looking at uh, a single uh, project. Um, we also need to differentiate between the commodities. Yeah, so hydrogen, uh, ammonia, fertilizers, the, the carbon and the greenness. So a, a number of countries are working on uh, green certificate systems in, uh, in, in order to underpin the greenness of the, of the hydrogen, so uh, guarantees of origin, etc., in order to ensure you prove the greenness through, through the value chain. Now with green certificates, there's no transfer of carbon. Yeah, it just proves that it has been produced uh, in a green matter. So I think we need to, in a way, de-link some of these notions in order to find the solutions uh, as to this uh, problem. Now, last but not least, if um, you of course have uh, other types of carbon pricing, now we, we, we will get CBAM in the EU, which means that if, if you have green fertilizer coming out of the region, then they will not be subject to, let's say, 80 euros per ton, uh, uh, let's say, import certificate. <laughs> Um, so that's a big differentiation already, and uh, that may well lead to a further integration of value chain in the developing countries rather than in the receiving end. 
uh, of these goods. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's great we started again talking about uh, certification and uh, the sort of guarantee of origin and green components. So I'm going to ask Anne Marie to tell us a little bit more about um, hydrogen methodologies and also how Perspectives Climate Group approached this topic. Thank you very much. So yeah, I was asked to talk about what are the foundations for getting carbon markets to unlock support for green hydrogen. And I also come from the Article 6 carbon market world uh, rather than the green hydrogen world. So it was really interesting to talk to my green hydrogen um, colleagues um, to get educated on that side of things. But indeed, um, the foundation for using carbon markets to support anything, including green hydrogen is trust in the actual carbon credit. Um, if you don't trust that it represents what it's supposed to, it's not worth anything. And we've seen that happen. And for carbon market revenue to be valuable for bridging that gap that we need to bridge in terms of the finance, um, you need to know what the price is going to be. You need to know someone's actually going to pay that price and for a meaningful volume that actually gets you to the, the numbers that that are bridging that um, bankability gap. And that's not for, to be taken for granted. And that's what uh, I think he was saying, that, that governments by, might be more potential at this particular moment to provide that long-term clarity on purchasing these at a particular price for particular types of credits, for example, specifically green hydrogen, because these particular attributes would also um, add value to particular types of carbon credits. But the foundation is that you trust the carbon credit and uh, that it represents what it's supposed to be representing, an additional verified ton of emission reductions or removals. And a big part of that trust is having methodologies that you trust. Um, so that's what um, Hugh and Gold Standard, um, Vera, then Perspectives together with um, South Pole. We have a um, hydrogen for net zero um, initiative, which is aiming to develop a full suit of methodologies for hydrogen, the whole uh, value chain, but also a variety of different applications. And um, I think Alexandra was noting that she couldn't really find many uh, methodologies at this moment, partly because it's a new market and it hasn't been developed yet. Um, so we're also trying to make it into a systematic um, package. And also, as, as he was saying, standardizing across standards. So that's something new that we're doing in that initiative, and that would certainly pave way then for Article 6 to also make use of these methodologies. But as was mentioned, Article 6 doesn't really, um, it's not really operational right now. Um, so one thing that we really need is, of course, the organizations and carbon crediting programs to use these methodologies. So methodologies alone are not going to solve the problem, but part of a bigger puzzle, many pieces in this puzzle. So having a full suite of methodologies is what our initiative will be developing. And then hopefully other things that also need to happen as foundations is to have an operational Article 6.4 mechanism or then the 6.2 bilateral approaches, which then can make use of the methodologies developed under Gold Standard and others. Um, but then that would be for generating of the carbon credits. But then you also need the foundation for the host countries as Article 6 to have the frameworks in place to authorize these carbon credits so that they can become ITMOs and have the kind of value that we might be expecting for green hydrogen um, units. Um, and then on the buyer side also to have a clear strategy on they actually wanting to buy these credits on the long term and willing to pay the price, which I think the differential, maybe an EUA price of the current would be enough to bridge the gap between green and gray. Um, but that's not the kind of prices we're seeing in the voluntary markets at the moment. So, but it's a chicken egg thing about the demand increasing once you have trust in the credits that you're buying. Um, and there, it is an interesting opportunity to have both government buyers and voluntary buyers as potential sources of, of purchasing. But there is a lot of pieces of this puzzle that still need to come together um, for these foundations to work. Thank you. I think now it's an exciting time because you've actually done a study on Article 6 and hydrogen in Chile. So we have an author who's done it, um, a case study. So I'd, I'd like to hear your views. And they're going to be controversial, I already know. But we look forward to hearing what you think um, might, might be the potential in Chile. 
Thank you. I will try to, to go fast. Uh, first of all, uh, maybe a, a brief summary of, of where we are related to green hydrogen in Chile. Um, Chile is one of the countries with the greatest potential to, to develop the green hydrogen or renewable hydrogen industry uh, around the world because we have or, or we come with one of the lowest projected uh, levelized cost of the production of green hydrogen. So uh, it's quite a great opportunity for the country and, and of course the government is taking that. Um, related to, to our commitments, our country has an updated NDC uh, launched by in 2020 that in its route to carbon neutrality by 2050, we have a, a, commitment, a commitment related to, to green hydrogen by 21% of the use of green hydrogen in, in different industries to, to reach carbon neutrality. So um, it is quite important for, for our climate action, but, but we have an analysis a, a, a recent analysis that show us that we can go further, uh, we can do more if we use uh, or, or if we trust in green hydrogen. Uh, this analysis shows us that it will be also allows us to, to go further in, in some sectors that are complex to the carbon as right now uh, uh, regarding to the technologies available uh, at the moment. So today uh, we can consider some sectors that are not into the NDC right now, such as a steel industry and aviation, and we can go uh, um, go further with a uh, cement industry and mining. So green hydrogen can can help us to to decarbonize uh, those sectors, and and it is important to to our commitments. So related to Article Six, uh, we can uh, it could contribute to to closing this financing and investment gap, or the economic feasibility of of green and renewable hydrogen projects. Um, and for this, Chile, is, uh, Chile has, has already a green hi hydrogen strategy and we are working right now in the, uh, in the government and, and in different ministries in the development of an action plan for green hydrogen for, for this emerging industry. And we are developing a national policy for the use of Article 6. So we are hoping to, to we can bring together this, to this, this new industry and these instruments to, to close the gap and afford to, to innovating for climate. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Isabella, and, and it's great that uh, we heard uh, that you have potential to use hydrogen internally in the country, not just export, and that gives us a room for Article 6, um, perhaps pilot projects. Uh, the study is done by GIZ, Perspectives Climate Group, um, and Government of Chile, so I really recommend the, the study. So we go to you, Michael, um, and could you, so you are, um, uh, of course, an ITMO buyer, so I'd like to know, uh, from your perspective, we, we talked about gaps in hydrogen economy, gaps in sort of Article 6 play, uh, play as well, uh, that needs to evolve further, and where do you see the capacity gaps uh, from your experience? Well, thanks a lot. Um, <clears throat> where to start? I think... We as the Click Foundation, we are one of the few buyers in the world buying ITMOs. Uh, we have a concrete mandate to procure a certain amount of these ITMOs and we started already in 2019. Uh, we have received so far more than 100 program, Article 6 program proposals. None of them was, was related to uh, green hydrogen. Uh, on the other side, we receive quite some interest from countries telling us, uh, would you be willing to invest in green hydrogen projects in our country? So that's quite a, a strange situation. Uh, usually it's, it's the other way around, right? Uh, so um, what do we need? We need a business case, right? We need concrete examples. We need cases developed by program owners, by project developers who approach us uh, and tell us how and what they need uh, in order to, uh, to, make, to make their program, their green hydrogen program, um, uh, financially viable. Right? That's, we can, then can assess it, we then can select it, and then we can support it financially and purchase uh, uh, the most generated by these programs. So, uh, 
not much left from my side to, to invite all program owners and project developers to, to present their ideas to us and, uh, and enter into a discussion with us about the development of, of these programs. We, learn, we know that the countries are interested. Now we need to trigger the private sector to develop the business cases. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll definitely keep an out of that. We are definitely speaking to uh, heavy industries and industries producing hydrogen. I'm sure you all are. Um, and you too, Smeta, you are with UNIDO um, and you are supporting already global south, countries from global south, emerging and developing countries as well. Uh, in hydrogen projects, you are actually involved in actual projects on the ground and capacity building programs. And I know carbon pricing is, uh, is, is an area that you're developing a strategy. What can you tell us so far on that front? Thank you very much. Um, indeed, so UNIDO, uh, at UNIDO we recognize the potential for net zero industrial development in the global south thanks to green hydrogen. But there's loads of uh, challenges, uncertainty in the market, uh, whether it's market uncertainty itself, technical uncertainty, um, there is also the political uncertainty and some social uh, aspects to it as well. So responding to this, um, we launched the global program for hydrogen in industry in July 2021. And uh, we have different types of intervention at global level, at country level, um, looking at policies, standards, financial instruments, skills, know-how, um, innovation, and coordination. But um, all of these can be fixed. The biggest one that we find is the financing, right? Um, the business case... Um, as has been mentioned several times, is uh, difficult to prove. Feasibility studies are very costly to do for hydrogen projects and very few um, banks are, are doing that. So, um, but imagine we get through all of this and um, we do have a business case. Um, the... Um, capital cost to set up um, the production, the capital cost to even um, for the end users of the hydrogen that is produced is high. You, if you're a steel industry, you need to repurpose your um, uh, production system. And uh, capital cost is high, trans uh, operational cost is also high. So how can Article 6 contribute to that. We've heard before, Article 6 is only applicable um, to green hydrogen if it's used in the country. And that's what um, we're trying to help countries, developing countries do, to create a local market for it. And so now how can Article 6 contribute to that? One thing would be if um, upfront payment can be done um, for the development of these types of projects, that would help. Otherwise, capex is so, 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 so high. Thank you. I think we have still two and a half minutes. We've done it, everyone had the floor. I think really, this is great, but I wanted to perhaps just, I think it's a very important point that upfront investment. Um, would you like to comment on that, Fenella and uh, Alexandra? Yeah, I can, I can, I mean, when it comes to carbon finance, uh, the buyers that are currently active don't provide upfront finance for, um, I mean, not for the implementation of projects, for project development, Click Foundation provides upfront support for the development of projects, but not for the actual investment into projects. So it will be difficult to get upfront finance through carbon finance. But Vilela, maybe you have yeah. better news. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, I, I'm going to be really controversial here, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> are we actually talking about green hydrogen or are we talking about renewable energy? What's the methodology? You know, I see Hannah Marie, you know what I'm talking about. You know, it's 
We're making electricity out of green energy that then happens to make green hydrogen. The green hydrogen is sold to another country. As you're saying, it's all developing. The, the renewable energy is cheap in the developing countries. They'll make the green hydrogen, then it'll be sold to the developed countries. So the green hydrogen bit, when it's consumed, creates no carbon trade. There's no carbon credit there. All it does is it helps Japan, Korea, Europe meet their targets, as you said, Jan Willem. So is it actually large renewable energy projects that we're talking about here in Morocco or Indonesia or anywhere else? Okay, if it is, challenge number one, you've got to chop gold standard out of that because you can't have methodologies for large renewable energy anymore because it's seen as business as usual. So how are we going to now get the carbon credits for the renewable mm -hmm. energy bit? Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing the numbers add up. That's my challenge. Now, maybe a policy approach, which <laughs> it's the grid that needs the money to cope with the extra renewable energy. Yes. Or it's climate finance. But that's my open question. And I know you're getting a serious signal from the end there. So. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, I think it's, it's, we're going to definitely call, find each other during lunch. You've, you've seen all the speakers, they're all experts in this field, um, and they are, they've been also very, very good with time. So I would like would to thank everyone uh, for, for your participation, for everyone also listening and staying the whole time. Sure. I really because appreciate it. I've learned a lot. I'm sure you all did too. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. you think so? So that's now we have to.